Always a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, big Friday night for you, uh, for AEW. Just, I guess, give me uh, a landscape as to what fans can expect and what you're most excited for. Well, mo the most exciting thing about Friday night is being back here in Jacksonville, and we've got the great support of the fans that started AEW. Of course, we launched the promotion here in Jacksonville, and we toured the world. And then we were here in Jacksonville every Wednesday for over a year through the global pandemic. We did all of our shows here. It was awesome and we did them safely. We had zero COVID transmissions doing the shows outdoors. I did it, my idea was like a drive-in movie theater. And then the Jaguars ended up doing the same thing. There were only two teams in the NFL that had fans week one of the 2020 season. It was the Chiefs and the Jaguars. And we got through a whole football season with zero known COVID transmissions, having fans there every week. And then AEW, same thing, zero known COVID transmissions over a year of wrestling matches, and then went back on the road. And we did shows all over the world and have done now uh, everything from the Arthur Ashe Stadium in New York, uh, the Coca-Cola Coliseum in Toronto, the Forum in LA, the United Center in Chicago, Little Caesars in Detroit and everything in between. And the best is when we can come back down here to Jacksonville where it all started. And we've got a huge show that's gonna be live on TNT, 10 p.m. here in Jacksonville. And a ticket's still available for Friday Night Rampage at Daly's Place. We've got this really popular tag team, and now they're the top team, the World Tag Team Champions, the Acclaimed. The Acclaimed is a tag team that actually started here in Jacksonville, literally in Daly's place. It was two young singles wrestlers up and coming who had never been on TV yet, Max Caster and Anthony Bowens. And I'd seen Max as a rapper on Twitter, Platinum Max, he did these great raps. And I thought we could integrate it. It could actually be his entrance on television in AEW. And I had this idea for a tag team. There's another great charismatic wrestler. He's a great athlete, former college baseball player at Seton Hall, uh, Anthony Bowens. And even though they never teamed, I thought they would be great as the acclaimed together. They really worked hard. They started at the bottom and worked their way to the top, and they've become the most popular tag team possibly ever in AEW, and really, I think, possibly the most popular tag team in the world right now. And uh, Max and Anthony, they've gotten so popular, they've risen to the top, they're the champions, and they have this thing that's really become so huge with the wrestling fans, which is the scissoring. And they do the scissor me, and unfortunately for them, Another wrestler, a wrestling lawyer and manager named Smart Mark Sterling trademarked this scissoring and the scissor me out from under them. And he's putting the trademark up against their titles. So on Rampage, it's gonna be Smart Mark Sterling's varsity athletes and this trademark for the scissoring against the Acclaims World Championship. Titles versus trademarks. That's part of a huge Rampage card. And that's a lot of what the fans can expect is great wrestling like that and we're going to have a big night. A lot of the local favorites will be in action, and it's just going to be a great night, and it's live to the entire world. AEW's on in over 130 countries now, and it all started here in Jacksonville, and it comes back to Jacksonville at 10 p.m. on TNT at Daly's Place. Talking about a coming full circle moment, um, earlier in the week you announced uh, Chris Jericho's kind of new structure within the company and the deal that you announced. I know he was there from the beginning, and he's meant a lot to this company, a lot to the wrestling industry as a whole. How excited are you for, for the future of Chris Jericho within your company, and how do you envision him being a part of this company? Well, Chris Jericho, as you said, was here from the very beginning when we announced AEW in the parking lot of the Jaguar Stadium and before we took it all over the world now, uh, broadcast worldwide. And Chris Jericho has had great ideas and also has been a great wrestler. But this year, 2022, has been his biggest year in AEW yet. We've seen Chris Jericho come into the year more physically fit than he's ever been in AEW and really in the prime physical condition of his entire legendary career. This has been his best year, I really believe, for sure in AEW and up there with his best years in pro wrestling period. He is a guy who's, been to, who's, he's a guy who's been to the very top of the pro wrestling profession. And to have Chris in AEW as the first ever champion was huge. Now he's lost over 31 pounds this year. And when we went into Toronto, Chris is a Canadian legend. And to have him at the top of the profession, he's the Ring of Honor World Champion, which is another company that's been around for 20 years. I recently acquired the promotion this year. So it's a second wrestling company I own. And uh, AEW has become so successful. And now Chris dominating Ring of Honor. He calls it the Ring of Jericho. 
and he says he's going to decimate the company and all of our former champions of Ring of Honor. And also, Chris, of course, the first champion of AEW. But he's had some of his best matches this year, whether it was a classic match at Revolution against Eddie Kingston or in Las Vegas. Of course, uh, Re- can I, if I may, a Revolution in Orlando, uh, a mm-hmm. great show we did here locally, uh, Double or Nothing in Las Vegas. Uh, we had the Blood and Guts match at Little Caesars Arena. A uh, classic match that Chris had, of course, with Brian Danielson in our Grand Slam Tournament of Champions. And then at Grand Slam, he won the Ring of Honor title from Claudio Castagnoli, defended it against Brian Danielson in Toronto. And Chris, through the entire year, has just been on top of the profession. And to me, uh, this is Chris Jericho's prime in the wrestling business, but also the ideas he brings to AEW. Really, he's such a huge uh, asset to us as a company. and really his mind he has great ideas for other wrestlers he has great ideas for people to assert themselves make them more aggressive on tv he brings the knowledge of the wrestling business so he's really valuable not only is a great top wrestler still one of the best in the entire world and arguably i think again through a 30-year career doing some of his best wrestling in AEW every week right now on Wednesdays and Fridays. A great commentator on Friday Night Rampage very regularly. And also to have Chris Jericho as a producer. I think he brings a lot to AEW week in, week out in AEW from the very beginning and now in 2022 and for sure for many years to come. So what is the biggest difference between what he was to what he will be now with this new deal? Is he going to be directly in the creative brain of Tony Khan bouncing ideas off of it. That's it. He, Chris always has been. I think it's formalizing something that's really been there all along. Chris has always had ideas for himself and other people that he's given, you know, a lot of uh, time and thought to and then brings me ideas and Chris is really organized and he's presented a lot of great ideas to me over the years and I love working with Chris and Chris loves working with young talent. He's done it all along. Sammy Guevara is a great example of a young talent Chris identified and has brought in. And now Chris has you know, really worked closely with a lot of the young wrestlers, giving them ideas. So I think it made sense to have Chris's mentorship there. And he's a, you know, somebody I already work really closely with. And it's always been that way. I think it's just you know, giving a little more formality to it. So Chris being the Ring of Honor champ, um, Ring of Honor is very interesting right now in how it's structured. What is your vision next year for the future? Um, I know in a recent interview you did with Sports Illustrated, you kind of compared uh, what WWE is, is WWE is Coke, you guys are Pepsi. Um, is Ring of Honor going to be the NXT to AEW's WWE next year? Is that a structure you're considering? No, I think Ring of Honor is its own independent company. There's okay. differences. And, you know, Ring of Honor is not owned by AEW. It's a separate promotion I bought, and it's got over 20 years of history. Mm-hmm. So I think it's really cool. Now, together, the video library we built is something really cool because now we've done Uh, This coming week will mark 160 episodes of Wednesday Night Dynamite, almost half of which I believe were here in Jacksonville at Daly's Place. And now bringing Rampage, we've done about 60 episodes of Rampage, which started right after our residency here in Jacksonville ended. And we've done a few episodes coming back, but this will be our first live Rampage ever in Jacksonville at Daly's Place coming up on Friday night. Very special to have it and to have a Jaguars home game, of course, playing the New York football giants here in Jacksonville. Very cool and uh, just going to be really, really awesome uh, having that here. Is Jade Cargill on the on the card on Friday night? Jade Cargill says she's going to take back her TBS championship belt. She is a, the TBS champion, and she holds the title, and she holds the longest undefeated streak in AEW and one of the greatest undefeated streaks ever in pro wrestling, the current TBS champion. Her belt was stolen by former women's world champion Nyla Rose, who's running around with the TBS title. So we'll see. I think there's going to be... Uh, hopefully an attempt by Jade, who says she's going to take over Rampage if she doesn't get her belt back. So, uh, who, you know, we'll see what happens there. Jade Cargill is a huge part of AEW, a former JU basketball player and one of the most dominant women's wrestlers on the planet, one of the most dominant wrestlers on the planet, period, frankly. And great to have Jade not only a part of the Jacksonville community, but also here in AEW. And we'll see if she's going to secure that belt physically back, but she's a great champion for AEW. AEW's roster has been... Um has added and added talent over the years. 
in your opinion right now, how is the roster unfolding? How, how is it? I know there was shuffling in September with, with the suspensions and all that, but how is the roster right now? How happy are you with it? We have a tremendous roster. I believe we have the strongest roster in pro wrestling. We have some of the best men and women on the planet, great champions and great contenders up and down the card, young wrestlers, veterans, and not only some of the best in-ring wrestling, but also some of the best promos, some of the best interviews, and we do some of the most compelling television. Dynamite has been really consistent. I think Dynamite's had a great year, and there's been some of our best episodes, especially in recent months. We've done shows recently, like uh, we came back, of course, we had the House of the Dragon episode, and uh, just in the last two months, and you know, coming out of the summer, had amazing shows like AEW Grand Slam, our anniversary episode, our international debut in Toronto, and this great title Tuesday we did this past week, and those have all just been in the last uh, month. So pretty amazing run we're on on Wednesday Night Dynamite and Friday Night Rampage with the roster coming back to full strength. We're going to start having a lot of the top stars consistently on Fridays again because I think with the depth, we put more emphasis onto some of the young wrestlers. And if you look back at the summer on Friday Night Rampage, it wasn't as many of the top stars, it was more of the young wrestlers. And now uh, some of those young wrestlers have become top stars. A team like the Acclaimed have risen to prominence and they did a lot of great work through the summer on Rampage. You know, we have World Trios champions, that, the Death Triangle, and you might have seen Pac and the Lucha Brothers a lot through the summer on Rampage. Now they're top stars throughout Dynamite. And Orange Cassidy, the All-Atlantic champion, has been a fixture on both shows, Dynamite and Rampage. But I think now we're getting more of the top stars. John Moxley had a great match teaming with Claudio Castagnoli, one of the new wrestlers you mentioned. They blended together. They're a great unit. And it was great to see the world champion, John Moxley, of AEW, the world champion, and the former Ring of Honor world champion, Claudio Castagnoli, teaming. And we had a great rating for Rampage this past week. It was the highest since Grand Slam, which those are probably the two highest we've had since the summer. And I think you can expect to see more of the top stars on Friday, like we'll see uh, this week as a, as a result of the strong, the strong roster and a lot of the injured stars coming back. Because really what we had through the summer was a lot of the top stars out due to injury. And I think Chris Jericho and John Moxley were two top stars that really held it down in a major way, in addition to a lot of other great wrestlers. And then Brian Danielson came back from his injury, and we've been off to the races. We got a great star in MJF back. MJF, one of the top stars in pro wrestling, and I think that's been huge for the show. Also, Samoa Joe was filming a show, and he's the Ring of Honor World Television Champion. It was great to get him back and other big stars, so really great. And a lot of other big stars rising to the occasion. Orange Cassidy's become the AEW All-Atlantic Champion, one of the most popular stars. Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus battling it out with Christian Cage in the middle. That's been great to see. Uh, Eddie Kingston is somebody we really believe in. And in addition to that, uh, you know, a lot of top women stars. I think Tony Storm has been a fixture on the show and the work Tony Storm has done week in, week out is awesome. Dr. Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter are uh, quite the pair, and we'll see what they have in store for AEW. It was great to get Hikaru Shida back, and she had a great match with Tony Storm. And then Soraya has been a great addition to AEW. I'm excited to see what this rivalry between Soraya and Britt Baker, how it might unfold. And then Rio returned to AEW, and on Wednesday, Rio is going to have a great match against Jamie Hayter. Two of the top women in AEW, the first women's world champion, Riho, taking on Jamie Hayter, who's definitely one of the top contenders right now. So great stuff happening up and down the card. I talked extensively already about the acclaimed, who I think are just so exciting. What they're doing is so great. They've been a huge part of this year for us. And then, yeah, Brian Danielson came back, and I think ever since then, that's been a huge part of AEW stabilizing and really week in, week out. Uh, not only the dynamite being strong, but then being able to not only lock in having all your top people on Wednesday, but now also be having such a strong roster. People like Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland, Ricky Starks and Will Hobbs, huge part of this summer, and now putting the full strength into Rampage too. You talked about MJF, and I know storylines are very important, and a lot of times they're aligned with venues, with smaller sort of matches, but MJF is a star that has really taken off in AEW. Um, the last time I believe, at least I went, was at the match, um, was when he had the feud with CM Punk uh, right here um, in, in Jacksonville at Daly's Place. When you're building a storyline like MJF and the suspensions happen with, with Punk and, and the Young Bucks as well, um, does that throw off 
a storyline like MJF or does it provide an opportunity for you to take it in a different direction? It's really a great opportunity now with MJF and he's in this rivalry with John Moxley. They have history. They actually wrestled in Daly's place at All Out, but both of them have come so far. John Moxley is a world champion, is in a much stronger place now both personally and professionally than he was two years ago during the pandemic. And now he's toured the country as world champion and been in some of the biggest venues and sports in the world as the champ, as opposed to in 2020 when all of his matches were actually here in Daly's place. And also he's found sobriety. He started a family with Renee and now Renee is part of AEW officially, not just part of the family, but really part of the on-screen family also. So that's been really cool to see. And MJF has taken such a crazy turn too. I mean, MJF's come so far professionally. You know, his uh, last match before he left was against Wardlow, and Wardlow's another person who has come so far for AEW. He's the TNT champion, and while Max was out, he took another big step. He's been really important in the development of AEW. He had a great cage match against Cody Rhodes in Atlanta a couple years ago. It was an awesome match. And then to have uh, MJF versus Wardlow take place under the circumstances it did, maybe in some ways wasn't ideal, but MJF did put a big spotlight on the situation. And to have MJF back in AEW is a positive and it's great for the fans. And that's why he's back and it's awesome having him. And now MJF versus John Moxley at full gear for the world championship is certainly a top match in pro wrestling i think throughout the year there's been big matches this year big stories in pro wrestling in 2022 but now you have fans all over the world looking forward to november 19th just about one month from now it'll be taking place at the prudential center in new jersey on pay-per-view everybody can watch mjf versus john moxley for the world championship if john moxley's still the champion uh then which you know he's a fighting champion and we'll see because he may take a fight or two and this could take a twist or turn between now and then but i do think that's a match that fans all over the world will be looking forward to i think what happened last month um with cm punk in the press conference shocked a lot of people um do you have an update on, on any of that any of the suspensions and if if and when we may see any of those wrestlers back. I can't comment on uh, any of what happened, but I, I'm you know, uh, excited about what's happening in AEW, and I'd love to talk more about it if I could, but I can't. And mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be really exciting what's happening here. It's just great to be back in Jacksonville, of course. Um, do you have an update on Hangman Page? How's he doing? He's doing really well. I talked to him uh, just in the past 24 hours and also you know, saw him not long after he was uh, officially cleared. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, I saw him right after he came back and he was uh, not long after we took him to the hospital, he got out and it was great to see him in good spirits that night. And you know, about 90 minutes after he got hurt, he was smiling and feeling pretty good. So that's about as fortunate as we could be given that he got knocked out in the match. And I thought the doctors and the referee handled it really well because that's what you have to do in a big fight. If one of the fighters gets hurt, that that's what you need is a referee that's gonna come in and, and do the right thing, stop the fight. And then Hangman, you know, the doctors took care of him, got him out of there. John, of course, uh, I thought handled it very well in his interview. He was very classy afterwards. And then, of course, after they safely got Hangman out of there, we saw then going forward, it's going to be John Moxley versus MJF for the world championship. And that is a huge story in pro wrestling, but also I think one of the most important stories in pro wrestling that takes precedent over everything right now is Hangman's okay. And Hangman's another great former world champion, somebody that's been awesome for this company from the beginning, from day one, and is a huge part of it, and also was a huge part of the summer, and a great part of the Grand Slam, the winner of the Golden Ticket Battle Royal, and uh, he was having a great match against John Moxley, and it was very unfortunate he got knocked out there, but uh, both men, I think, have a great future in AEW, and two great champions, John Moxley and Hangman Page. I think the most interesting question that I have for you um, from someone who kind of looks at wrestling from the outside in. Um, when you're watching a match and you're building a storyline, how do you know that, without looking at ratings, pretend you can't see ratings or you never looked at ratings, when are you able to tell if a, pay, if a pay per view or a match is really, really successful? And how are you able to tell that? 
Well, that's, there's a caveat because you said you can't look at ratings or buy rates, I assume, are not included. No mm -hmm. ratings or pay-per-view buy rates. Nope. So I think live attendance and merchandising are great metrics, but also one of the most important things is the reaction of the fans in the arena. I spoke earlier to you about the World Tag Team Champions, the acclaimed, and their rise to prominence. And I think a lot of it, you know, I've always believed in them and from the very beginning. And that's, I think, the story of the acclaimed and how they came together. And they're the first homegrown stars of AEW. And it started right here in Jacksonville at Daly's Place, where we're having this match on Friday night. And I think that's why it's so important to us. And then the scissoring is something that rose organically. And it's their rightful intellectual property. They're fighting and they're putting it all on the line to get it back. So it's really compelling. And it's great to have, uh, you know, those kinds of great stories in AEW. And I think that's just one great example of uh, what it's all about. But it's cool being back here in Jacksonville and uh, kind of that, that rise to prominence is uh, emblematic of how so, so much of it was grown here in this community. And, uh, you know, the, the journey we've taken, I think those guys are a huge part of it. So it'll be uh, really cool to bring it back here. From one passion to the other, uh you know, AEW born in Jacksonville, but the Jaguars came first uh, when you guys came here just a little over a decade ago. Um, the team looks looks great. I know the record isn't indicative of that, but I think a lot of fans in the area understand that this is different from years past. Just your impression of the team this year and with talking with Doug and Trent, just how pleased are you with the progress that's been made? Well, it's really cool. Uh, you know, from the beginning, I think, Trent has been working really hard and he's a great player evaluator, a great talent evaluator, works really hard. And I've watched every Jags game for years side by side with Trent and the improvement year over year is so, so uh, obvious. I think the really the coaching of Doug Peterson, Doug coming into this community uh, with, as a proven winner, it's been great. It's somebody who's got the right mindset and also is just a really great person and, you know, is a people person and that's a lot of what it takes to be a great head coach in the NFL. You have to be organized and Doug's a brilliant play caller, but he's also a people person and it goes a long way, especially today. And Doug is uh, the right guy and now with this young team, Trevor leading the offense and a lot of great players and, of course, Mike Caldwell coming in, and he's, we have a lot of great young players. Trent's done a great job accumulating talent, I think, uh, especially young players on defense that have come in, and we've built a, a, a strong offense through the draft and free agency, and it's really something to see it come together, and I work on the analytics side of it and have since I first got here, and I think more so than ever it's being embraced both in coaching and scouting. Trent had a great history working with analytics when he was the general manager of the San Francisco 49ers. And Doug had a great history working with analytics, of course, as the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles. Both of them, of course, went to the Super Bowl, running those teams, doing the, respectively as the GM and the coach. And Doug won the Super Bowl as the head coach of the Eagles. So it's, it's really great to work with guys with that level of experience and success and hopefully things they can bring here, but also they're both great people and I think it's great working with them. And my dad has built this great uh, leadership. You know, it starts with Doug and Trent and what they do day to day. And uh, Doug has just been a breath of fresh air, especially in this past year. And the improvement year over year, I think is so evident to anybody who watches all the games and uh, huge credit to Doug and his staff and, and the hard work of the players. When you say analytics, um, is it safe to say that that was one of the most important things when you were looking for a head coach, that everything kind of aligned with the way that you view analytics, with the way that Trent views analytics? Was that very, very important? It was definitely an important thing. And, you know, like I said, it's about human, it's about, you know, human interaction, people, and finding a head coach that's a good person and, and an honest person and definitely a good leader, you know, above all else. But then absolutely somebody that has a history working with analytics and embracing it in their decision making, that is definitely something you want in coaching and in scouting and all of us working together and especially uh, those guys making the key decisions for the team. And, you know, they get on very well themselves, Doug and Trent. I think that's really important. And uh, Doug is the leader of the team and the face of the team is just the right person. And uh, he definitely has a great history you know, making calls, uh, some integrating analytics into his process, but it's Doug's call and he's a brilliant, brilliant play caller and a great guy. And that's what uh, makes him a great head coach in this league. What is different about Trevor Lawrence this year versus last year? 
Well, he's taken the leap. I think if you look at Trevor Lawrence's stat line across the board, he's made really noticeable improvements in every category, and that's what you want to see from a second-year potential franchise starting quarterback, top player in this league, I think, uh, is what we want to see Trevor become as the goal. And now Trevor's really taken the steps that you want to see in the second year of somebody who's just doing a great job making the leap. And, you know, whether it's his completion percentage, yards per attempt, uh, his touchdown to interception ratio, uh, he's just throwing less interceptions, throwing more touchdowns and doing everything you want to see. He's a great person for the community. He does it uh, on and off the field. So he's just brought it all. And from day one, he had the right mindset. And you're seeing it's paying off on the field. And again, I think Doug doing a great job uh, leading the team on the field. Trent's brought in good talent around Trevor, and it's all paying off, and, and most of all, Trevor's hard work and, and talent and what he brings to the football team. Obviously, with your dad and, and you being a high-ranking executive in the organization, um, you want to win, and every year when, when you lose, the way this organization has, it's tough. Can you tell a difference in, I don't know, the way your dad wakes up every day and goes to work this year and just, you know, you, you, the record is a losing record, but like I said earlier, it's a breath of fresh air with Doug with the way the team has performed. Do you sense your dad's mindset or him just going to work every day is, is much improved this year? I think my dad has much more confidence and a much better feeling going in every day now than he ever has. And this is our 11th season. And, you know, we've had some great success in years past and working with great people. And, and certainly the 2017 season in particular was a great year. But you're right. I mean, there's been a lot of difficult seasons leading up to this one. And now uh, I think my dad feels better this year than he really ever has about what we have going, the young team that's, that's coming together and, and taking big steps this year under Doug and you know the talent Trent's accumulated and certainly working with these guys and the calls my dad made uh, you know through the evaluation process you know I was at every interview and I think he made the right choices uh, and Doug was the right person to be the leader of the franchise and I think that's why everyone's so excited about Doug Peterson and what he's done for Trevor and the whole team and uh, the offense and the hire he made with Mike Caldwell leading the defense it's real great. I'll ask you just a general um just progress of downtown Jacksonville. This is a place that um, you guys have obviously set your roots in with the Jaguars. Um, can you give me an update on uh, the shipyards and the Four Seasons? Is any of that kind of in the works to happen? I can't, uh, I'm not really, that's not my end of the team or what I do, but yeah, uh, it's more I'm Mark. sure that's definitely Mark Lamping and Got my it. dad and, and my family. They do a lot of that great stuff and mm -hmm. uh, that's not as much what I do. I'm definitely more the on-field product or in the ring yep. product, whether it's uh, AEW as far as the matchmaking or uh, the analytics for the Jags or um, Player, player transfers and uh, loans and transfers for Fulham, you know, as the director of football. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of things I mostly am focused on. Um, I'm starting to do more of that work with the NFL. I'm part of the NFL major events and fan engagement committee. But um, definitely uh, that particular end would be good for uh, Mark or Mega or my dad or my sister or a lot of other people, but not me as much. I'm not doing as much of that. Got it. And then, so so Lemon Bar, you don't know what's going uh, I have on. Got a, I know what's going on with it, but I, I mean, I'm like my dad or Mega or, you know, my family would be good to talk to. I'm not doing as much of that. I got it. Got it. Okay. But uh, th that came as a surprise, I think, to a lot of people that, you know, your dad was dabbling in at the beach, obviously downtown. <laughs> but um, is that going to happen more frequently? Is your dad going to kind of be diving into, you know, exploring beach properties. I mean, I'm not sure about what uh, exactly would be next, but I think this is really exciting news that he made this investment and now that uh, that beach is going to have his presence and what he's going to do for that community like he's done for a lot of other communities and uh, built up infrastructure here and overseas all over the world. I think it's great news uh, for beach residents and uh, for him. It's going to be great and for us. So it's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and then my last question. Uh, Downtown, your vision for it in an ideal world, what would you like downtown Jacksonville to look like in the future? Uh, I think the community's really, again, uh, very fortunate. My dad's taken a very keen, keen investment and an interest in this community and now uh, is going to really do his best to build it up. And I, again, not my end as much the real estate development, but I do think uh, just the downtown 
community in general, there's a bunch of really great minds coming together. My dad's one of them, and I think there's a lot of other uh, like-minded people trying to build up the downtown area. And uh, hopefully in the coming years, in addition to what we have going with uh, NFL football, AEW wrestling, UFC, my good friend Dana White brings here regularly. We have minor league baseball and, of course, uh, with the Jumbo Shrimp and a lot of great events and concerts. And now I think uh, more downtown infrastructure, hotels, uh, more restaurants and just more fun things and more uh, living more residences downtown and around the downtown area and, and bring more young people downtown because it's fun. So uh, I think it'll be great.